I'm going to try again see if this connects better. Hello, trying again. Is it a better connection now? Hey, Stacy. I hope I get Kelly back. Y'all comment. Oh, good. Bless your heart. Sorry about that. It is really booming outside. I don't know if y'all can hear it. Hey, Suzanne. <laughs> yeah, those grandsons can absolutely uh, interfere with the schedule, can't they? Hey, Wanda. Bless your hearts. <coughs> Let's hope this thing stays connected. And also, hey, Kathleen, pray that I don't go into a coffin fit. Because those are part of daily life around here now. I know I sound like I'm in a bucket. I can be like Gomer Pyle and do my thinking in a bucket. <coughs> well, let's go ahead and get started. <coughs> this, um, this Bible study, wow. It has, it has morphed quite a few times. Because I began studying this a couple of weeks back. You remember I had to cancel two weeks back and then we had to cancel this last week because we were so badly sick but um let, let me share with you the titles that this thing has morphed from y'all are going to get tickled hey late hey brigitte the first time it was why me lord and then the next time it was that's not fair and the next title was what were you thinking god and then the last one the one today is, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. So you can see, <laughs> it has progressed from a, a really dark place <laughs> to better now. Oh, thanks, Brigitte. I tell you what, we have been hit with it. Paul and I get sick, you know, like everybody else, we'll get a cold or something. But this thing came out of nowhere. And it hit us hard, and it hit us fast, and um, and nobody else was sick. Um, you know, some of the kids had some little allergy things, but you know that's not uncommon. And um, but nobody else had this, and thank the Lord, nobody has gotten it since. Um, so anyway, so y'all just pray for me as I go along, and if I get a little scatterbrain, it's okay. I've prayed and God's going to cover it. <laughs> um, going back to us being sick, and I wanted to start off with that. Where the Bible study began, like I said, it was several weeks ago, and I was studying through about the things of this world stealing our joy and stealing our peace and stealing our strength our spiritual st strength and things like that and um that's where the study began but as as i had you know started going down that path and then we got sick and you know when you're sick especially with chest and head stuff you can't read you just your your mind doesn't focus and so for about four or five days we literally slept except to get up and get something to drink and go to the bathroom for days. We just slept and slept and slept and prayed and prayed and prayed. And um, then when that, that sleeping stage was over, I was able to get up and, and read. And I read quite a lot because I couldn't do anything else. My days are pretty busy with just different activities here on the farm and with grandkids and kids and, you know, things that I do and um, the garden and all that, which Lord help us is a mess. But I was able to sit and read a lot. <laughs> hey, Lenny. And um, 
in that reading, he began to really open my eyes to things about how we absorb things into our lives. And so that's really what our topic's going to be about today is about absorbing and, and things that affect our daily walk. Now, I posted a list of scriptures, and there's more. So these first few are going to be ones that were not on that list. So I'll repeat the reference slowly so you can write it down. <coughs> but in this, over and over again, I kept hearing the Holy Spirit telling me, Every little thing affects you. Every little thing. If you go, if you're perfectly healthy, perfectly fine, nothing wrong, nothing's hurting, and you go to the store to pick up a jug of milk, and you walk past a person that's got the flu, and that person sneezes, and you don't touch them, but even the doctor told me when I, we went in for our... our um, appointment that air droplets from a sick person can carry that virus up to eight feet just from them breathing or coughing or sneezing eight feet in any direction so if you there walk right past them and inhale and that droplet of air gets into your system it affects you um, we all know that to some degree, but isn't it shocking when you think about all the places that you go and all of the people that are within eight feet of your body at any moment in time or touch a doorknob or touch a shopping buggy handle, all of that in some way or another is beginning to bombard your body, right? So... It really is phenomenal that we aren't sicker than we are. Wouldn't you agree? But as I was reading the scriptures and going through the process of allowing the Holy Spirit to bathe me in what he was trying to teach me, I remembered a movie years and years ago. And somewhere in that movie the guy wanted to make wine or was making wine and he was talking about it and he held up a, I don't know, a cup of wine or whatever, something for the other person to smell. And he said, now close your eyes and smell this wine. What do you smell? And the person said, uh, mushrooms, rosemary, you know, the herb, rosemary, and went down a list of things that they could smell. And the guy said, it's all in there. It's all in that wine. Because everything where those grapevines grew, the grapevines absorbed all of those influences. It absorbed into the the structure and the, the whatever, the juices flowing through this vine was absorbed to create the flavor that came out in those grapes. Does that make sense? And uh, hey, here, Sean, I'm not meaning to miss anybody, but, but that wine absorbed all of that that was around it. And that movie line came into my consciousness, and I began to think about that and how amazing that is. To think about, it, it's not, it's not like, it's not like you put something in there. It just sort of, by osmosis, I guess, it just absorbs because of the atmosphere around it. And the Holy Spirit began to show me, because we, as spiritual beings, are, are open to, to the influences around us, even though we may not realize it. We are absorbing things that are happening, sounds, scent. All of our senses are taking things in, attitudes, um, phrases that people say. Um, and even even the, the um, 
ungodly, the demonic, I, ha I hate to use demonic because, you know, people kind of went nuts with that back in the 80s, like everything had a demon in it. But, but you know, the ungodly influences around us are happening. And, um, and so as I was thinking about all of this and thinking about how somewhere in something Paul passed some person that came to work sick or, or, you know, he touched something at work that got him sick. Then he came home and gave me a big hug and a big old kiss. And then I got sick and, and like I said, thank the Lord that nobody else in the family's really gotten this, but we've, you know, there's sicknesses in the family, but those things, just like getting sick from a virus or a germ that we've gotten from somewhere else, spiritually, spiritually, we are affected in similar ways. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. That's what the Lord had me really focus on. And, you know, um, <coughs> those things a lot of times begin to take um, action in our lives before we even know it's happening. Now, as, as I go through the scriptures the Lord showed me today, if the Holy Spirit starts flashing something in your spiritual consciousness, don't dismiss it. Think about whatever it is he's showing you. Because a lot of times God will begin to, to reveal things and give us truths about our life but we discount that as some thought that popped into our head. We give ourselves way too much credit for coming up with stuff. A lot of times it's the Holy Spirit. And we need to think and recognize perhaps the Holy Spirit of God is trying to reveal something to us. He's been on me a lot about that lately. That I need to really slow down and pay attention when I start feeling or not feeling, hearing in my spirit something, I give myself way too much credit for godly thought. I, godly thought comes from one place, God. It's not me coming up with it. It's not you coming up with it. It's from the Holy Spirit of God. And we need to listen, 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 listen. Now we're going to start with these ones that weren't on the list. <coughs> Proverbs 13, 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Yes, that's, that's, that's pretty straightforward scripture right there. Proverbs 13, 20. Don't we all want to walk around with people who are wise? But then do you notice sometimes Hey, Jen, sometimes we, um, now let's just be honest. Sometimes we don't want to walk around with serious people because they're just not a lot of fun. You know what I mean? They're just always serious, always talking about serious stuff and you can't tell a joke. You can't just be silly because they're always serious. Well, I know what you mean, but, but look, we've got to grow stronger. And when we grow stronger, we got to be more sober minded, more serious thinking. I think there's been a lot of silliness going on that needs to quit. And I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you what. The silliness, the fun little cutesy stuff isn't going to get you through the hard stuff. And I'm talking to myself. That's not going to strengthen me when the stuff gets bad. I need the real deal. 
I love brownies. I absolutely love brownies. And actually yesterday I had to fight, fight off the kingdoms of hell to not go in there and make brownies. I'm diabetic. I can't eat brownies. But I'm also trying to lose weight. I definitely can't eat brownies. Hey, Carol. <coughs> I'm glad you made it. But what I needed was some meat. I needed some protein in my system. And brownies would have been good. But I needed meat. But you ever just don't feel like eating meat? Well, that's where I was yesterday, but but Paul actually took me to dinner, and, and I got Mugu Guy Pan, and it was loaded with chicken and mushrooms, and oh, it was perfect. But I sure would have liked to have some brownies, and we think that way spiritually. A lot of times, we just don't feel like dealing with the meat. Yep. Yeah. Oh, Suzanne. <laughs> Torturing me there. We just don't feel like spiritual seriousness. We just want to have a little fun. Let's just laugh a little bit. And and I understand that. <laughs> I really do. But it's the meat that makes us stronger. And if you if you walk around with people who are just silly and fun, that's one thing. But ladies, we've got to be digging. We got to be in the meat of the word. We just got we have to be. 1 Corinthians 15.33 Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. These are point blank scriptures. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Let's again be thinking about those little things that strike at you like a virus germ striking at your body to make you sick these little things evil communications there is a result an equal and opposite reaction right first corinthians 5:11 i know it is hard isn't it it's hard to find people who want to be serious about the things of god and you think about it, Jesus only had those close three. He had the 12 and then however many else was following him, but he had the close group of three. The close ones. You remember I've talked many times about finding your holy of holies, that little group of people that you know are going to keep you where you need to be spiritually. 1 Corinthians 5.11. Now, we love to deal with this on church-wide level, but let's deal with this on a personal level. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. Hi, Gloria. Thank you. Not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. Now, remember this is saying if somebody calls themselves a brother. So if somebody's saying they're a Christian, but they're still doing any of this and, and check out covetous. Covetous means wanting something someone else has got and spends a lot more time focused on that. Coveting, coveting, coveting. They may not be blatant about it, but if you're around a person who's constantly saying, oh, I wish I had that. Oh, I wish I was like her. Oh, I wish I had a car like that. Oh, I wish my house looked like that. I just... I just don't understand why God gave her all of that. And I, I, that's covetous. It don't have to be the big, big, big stuff. It can just be daily conversation. Remember, evil communications corrupt good manners. All of this goes together like pieces of a puzzle. All of it does. That scripture was 1 Corinthians 5.11. It's the one about not fellowshipping with a brother that's walking in sin. And think about being an idolater. We don't think of ourselves as idolaters, do we? 
But if we put another human above our focus of Christ, if we spend more time loving another he, a human or a thing more than Christ, that's idolatry. If you grieve yourself sick because you don't have something or can't do something or don't a certain person if you if you get what we say down here in the south if you eat your guts out about it that's idolatry it don't have to be a little shiny gold buddha sitting in your living room down here in the south May, it may not be this way where you guys are, but here in the South, there's a problem with football, college football. It is an idol. And a whole lot of Christians love it above all else. It's, it's a shame and a disgrace. But, and it's a real problem. And I'll tell you what. You bring it up on Facebook, boy, you better have your rubber boots on and because it's going to get thick. People get mad. It's idolatry, pure and simple. Um, it can be anything. It can be a dress. It can be a book. It can be a human. It doesn't matter. Um, a railer, a drunkard, an extortioner. We're not supposed to have fellowship. <clears throat> yeah, it does, Suzanne. It does. It, it really does make our social circle smaller. But now here, let me, let me say this. And I've heard people say this before. Well, Jesus ate with drunkards and, and prostitutes and tax collectors. Well, absolutely he did. And Jesus didn't have any problem with being affected by them. Jesus was so prayed up, so studied up, so equipped for that ministry. He didn't you don't have to worry about Jesus being affected by it. He didn't wink at some prostitute sitting across the table. He didn't laugh at their dirty jokes. He didn't eat everything like a glutton. He didn't lay back and, and make smart wisecracks with the rest of them. Jesus was there for a purpose. And I've sat it at dinner many times with people that I w didn't want my kids around. But I was there for a purpose, to love them and to encourage them into the kingdom. But they weren't calling themselves Christians. They weren't calling themselves followers of Christ. And that's what this scripture is addressing. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I'm going back and reading y'all's comments. That's it. It was to draw them to Christ. And they were, they were the lost. He was there to minister. And y'all know good and well. People might say they're going into a situation to minister. But they ain't no more going in that situation to minister than a man in the moon. They're going to have fun. There's a difference. I'm not saying you can't talk and laugh and have a good time with folks. That's obviously you can. And we should. We should not be the, the mean old mad Christians walking around who can't laugh. But y'all know what I mean. There's a difference here. And those, those putting ourselves into position of being in fellowship with ungodliness just so we can have a little fun and just forget all and forget everything, just go have a good old time. That's that's what I'm talking about. Matthew five thirteen through 16. <coughs> ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. 
we lose the strength of our spiritual character when we bend and sway pertaining to whoever we're around. When we allow the things of this world to infiltrate our life, we're useless to the kingdom. Useless. We must be set apart. And, and again, I'm, I'm going all the way back to where I started. When this virus that hit us or whatever this was, I don't know, I'm not a medical person, but whatever this thing was that hit us came at us before we even realized it was happening. We were somewhere, touched something, someone was near us, and it was absorbed into our body and began to wreak havoc before we ever knew what was happening. And as spiritual beings, we can easily be affected by the things that we put around ourselves, places that we put ourselves in, relationships that we're part of, either, either ignorantly or intentionally. Okay. Are y'all with me? I hope y'all are with me. First Peter 1, 13 through 15. Now I'm getting back on my list. This is the list I posted. And this is about not conforming. Okay? Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind... Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Remember, ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We know that scripture. I've probably used that in more than half of the Bible studies that I've, I've done here on Facebook. But look at verse 13. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Obedient children, fashioning yourselves not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. We were all ignorant. I had a big sign <coughs> when I was schooling my kids, big poster in our schoolroom, and it was dumb, stupid, and ignorant. Because, you know, that's what kids call each other. They'll say, you're just dumb. Oh, you're just stupid. Well, you're ignorant. And they don't know that it's not interchangeable. Dumb means you can't speak. When I was a kid, my grandparents, we call, they were deaf and dumb. They could not hear and they could not speak. That's what we call them, deaf and dumb. Now everybody says mute. Mute, same thing. Dumb means you can't speak. Stupid. Well, stupid is stupid. Ignorant means you don't have the information you need. Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Fashioning yourself. Making yourself into this being. You know, ultimately, we all choose what fashion of being we are going to be. We are either going to be fashioning ourselves through the grace of God into the image of his son. That's it. <laughs> stupid is as stupid does. Or we are going to be carnal. We are going to be worldly. That was another important point I made with my children. Don't be carnal. 
Carnal means thinking of this world and doing the things of this world and focusing on the things of this world. If you traveled the world and every time you entered into another country or culture, you changed your entire, you changed your language, you changed the stuff you ate, you, you adapted yourself 100% to that culture, and then next week you go on to the next one and you change yourself up completely to fit that culture, and then the next week you pass the border and go into another country and you change yourself into that culture, how confusing but don't we as, as women do that? We want to make the people that we're around happy and feel good. So we, we conform ourselves to whoever we're dealing with at the moment. I see women who are hunting for a husband and they'll, they'll reconstruct themselves every time a new guy comes into their life. This guy likes country music and horses and so all of a sudden she's got you know long hair and cowboy boots and she's wearing a cowboy hat and listening to the radio and listening to country music and then next week she meets some guy from new orleans that loves jazz and she's like a cool chick now and she's listening to jazz music and you know she's all into that and then you know the next week she meets an athlete and now she's in going to the gym she's conforming herself fashioning herself in ignorance. And we do the same thing. We do the same thing as Christians. And I'll tell you, because of of the plain lifestyle that we have we have walked in, we see uh, y'all wouldn't believe how many different kind of plain people there are. There's Torah keeping plain people. There's um Seventh day Adventist plain people, there's Mormon plain people, there's, you know, brethren plain people, there's Amish plain people, there's beachy Amish plain people, which is a whole nother ball game. There's just all these different aspects and people conform themselves to that belief. But what are we supposed to be conforming ourselves to? You do the fashioning in some sense, but ultimately the real deal, and I'm getting ahead of myself, the real deal is the transforming. I'm getting ahead of myself. Psalms 1 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Yes, Jan, be not conformed. Yes. Not in the counsel of the ungodly. If you, if you are going to fashion yourself in such a way, don't do it to imitate what is not of God. Just because it's pretty or fun or interesting or intelligent or uh, accommodating or encouraging, that does not make it of God. And... <coughs> Exodus 23, 1 and 2. Now this was a good scripture I found. Kelly, you know, I think we all do that. We all conform ourselves over time. And that's the thing. We've got to be transformed. We've got to be so changed. And again, I'm getting ahead of myself, but don't don't feel guilty about that because that, that is a human weakness and it is a weakness of women. We're weak. We want to please people. So we do conform ourselves. We mold ourselves into what we think women, the women around us or the men around us want us to be. And it's hard to break out of that, but it is possible. It is possible. And, and we're going to do this together. We're going to do this. Exodus 23, 1 and 2. <clears throat> Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. 
neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Neither shalt thou countenance a poor man in his cause. If thou meet thine enemy's ox or ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. If thou see the ass of him that hateth thee lying under his burden, and wouldest forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. The thing is, we've got to be diligent to do what we know is the right thing to do. We cannot slip up because the folks that we like are doing this or believe in this. Well, it looks right and they're my friends and, and there's nothing wrong with what they're believing. It, it may not be exactly right, but they're really, they're, they're, their hearts are good. Paul says this all the time. He says, follow the process to the end. He says that all the time. And, and he's, what he's saying is, just because you think something looks right or looks good, think it through to the end outcome. I may feel connected to someone and I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to make them feel bad. I just want to love them and, and encourage them and yeah, they don't care anything about God or, or they're really walking in sin, but I don't want to make them mad. I, I, they're just so sweet. I just, you know, and I've, I'm saying that because I've done it. I've done it, but I'm not helping them. I'm not, I get in these traps of, of not wanting to hurt somebody's feelings. So I never can quite come to the moment when I need to tell them the truth because now I've laid out this groundwork of not trying to hurt their feelings. So if I say something now, I'm really going to hurt their feelings. So I can't say that. And I just want to be their friend and I don't want to make them mad at me. And do y'all know what I'm talking about? I have lost my savor. I am now useless to that person because I don't want to make them mad. I don't want them to reject me. I don't want to hurt their feelings. They're such nice people and everybody loves them. But if, if we follow that process to the end, we've condemned them for eternity because we've not given them the tools to get out of whatever they're in. You see what I mean? That's right. It is. Boy, isn't it hard when it's family? It is so hard. It is hard. And I think because it is hard, we sort of shove it to the back of our head and say, there'll, there'll be a moment. I'll have a moment, and I'll deal with it then. And, you know, we really, you got to hear from the Holy Spirit. You got to hear from the Holy Spirit. Romans 12, 2. Now we're back to being conformed. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here's, yeah, it does. Family does break your heart. But see, Jane, you've got that beautiful, teachable spirit. And, and wouldn't it be wonderful if we were all that way? If we all had that beautiful, teachable spirit with a right attitude. Sisters, let's just stop for a minute and just commit ourselves to having that heart change that we will be teachable to receive from God and from his people 
truth in love, even if it's gonna it's gonna hurt our feelings a little bit. Praise God if our feelings get hurt. Because we don't go by our feelings, do we? And and our feelings are quite often speaking for the flesh. Let's commit ourselves to having that teachable spirit to receive the truth from others without getting offended at them. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, conformed, <coughs> I always, I, I, I don't know if y'all are this way, but whenever I think of conformed, I think of a potter with the, with the clay on their wheel, on their, their pottery wheel. And, you know, you have to center your clay, you have to slam it down, and it's usually, you know, sort of in a roundish rectangle when you do that. And you have to force those edges into a rounded shape as it spins. You have to put force there. It hurts your hands. I've done it. I mean, it, it's, if you have any kind of weakness in your hands, boy, it's, <laughs> it's hard. But you have to do it. And every time I think of the, the word conformed, I think of that. I think of conforming, molding that clay to where it's in the shape that I want to be. And this world wants us to conform to its pattern. And if we don't conform to what it wants, it throws us out. It rejects us. You know, everybody talks about the Amish shunning people. The Amish got nothing on this world. The world shuns people quicker than you can spit. And I'm sorry if that's crude. It's the truth. This world will throw you out on a dime if you don't do what it wants you to do. Am I right? So what does that do? It creates fear in us, even from childhood, to conform. Our three um, teenage grandchildren started back school today. And they're in public school, and they're good kids. They love the Lord. They're good, good kids. Academically strong, great personalities. Um, you know, they're in the sports, on the sports teams. They're just great kids. And... They're the kind of kids that that will be the leaders because they are strong and principled, but they are faced with such pressure to conform. It's incredible. And, and Paul and I pray constantly over them, protection for their spirit, protection for their mind and their emotions because they are being pressured all the time to conform. Guess what? So are we. Yeah, we may not be pressured to um, smoke cigarettes and go out on Friday night and go to the drinking parties. Yeah, we may be past that. I hope we are. Maybe you're not pressured to wear the new blue jeans and t-shirts. But there's other junk trying to conform us in a, at our whatever age we are, whatever place we live in. Conform, conform, conform. But we don't want to conform. We don't need to conform. We need to transform. Conform is to mold. Transform is to change. Change. I don't want to be Angie. And this is, <clears throat> I wrote this down. This takes care of the phrase, God made me this way. God made me this way. He must have wanted me to be like this. Well, then why does he want us to be transformed? If he made you that way and he's okay with it, what was the point of all of it? Why, why did Jesus have to, to walk on the earth? Why did he have to be tempted in every way? Why did he have to suffer on that cross? Why did he have to be buried? Why did he have to rise again? Why do we have this massive book of the Bible to teach us how to not be the way we were when we were born? He wants us different. Different. Do y'all agree? He wants us different. Different. <coughs> 
<coughs> Hang on. And he, here's the other thing. He does not want us to be identical to each other. Not Stepford wives that we all live in this monastery or our, our convent. We all walk around in single file and don't speak and keep your eyes straight ahead. And the only words you can speak are the ones in red from the Bible. And and uh, no thought. Don't think. Don't think. That's, nobody said you're supposed to be like that. You don't have to be like me. <laughs> You don't have to be like me. I don't have to be like you. But you have to be like Jesus Christ. Guess what? I have to be like Jesus Christ. So isn't it just obvious that if you are trying to be more like Jesus Christ and I am trying to be like Jesus Christ, ultimately, we're going to be a lot alike. I mean, wouldn't that make sense? Yeah, we're at different places in this life. We have different influences. Different things are happening. Different people are in each of our lives. We each have a, a specific function in this walk. A different calling, if you will. But all of that, when functioning in perfection the way God designed it, we all meld together and we all become one. We become the bride of Christ, we all function together beautifully if we're all doing what we're supposed to do. It's not about you be like me, me be like you. It's not about being an individual. I'm just an individual. I have my own thing. No, you don't. Not if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You don't get your own thing. You get his persona. His life, his thoughts, his process, everything that was you where you got to be the individual no longer exists. Now it's him. It's all about him. And and any part that we do that's about us, yes, yes, Brigitte, I love that. Anything that we do that's about us is a waste of time and effort. It's a waste. Pointless. You know what prodigal means? Prodigal means wasteful. The prodigal son wasted what the father had set up for him. He went through all this worldly rigmarole trying to get what he wanted. Oh gosh, Wanda, that makes me nauseated. People are nuts. People are nuts. Uh, Proverbs 14, 12 through 15. It's all good. Bear with me now. Hang on. Carol just wrote something. Yes. Proverbs 14, 12 through 15. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. The black backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. Look at that phrase. A good man shall be satisfied from himself. The hardest person to bring to the Lord is a good man or a good woman. Let that sink in. The hardest person to bring to the Lord is a good man or a good woman. Why is that? Because they don't feel the need. All we like sheep have gone astray. But they don't feel that. They don't feel that deep conviction because they're not out there being ugly, nasty old people. 
They're good people. They're nice to everybody. They're kind. They work a job. They go home. They treat their family good. What do I need God for? I'm a good person. A good man shall be satisfied from himself. A backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. He doesn't see the need. Backslider means they were up here at one time and then they slid backwards. So that to me, that's talking about somebody who saw God, saw a need, but slid back to the old ways, fashioning themselves in, the, in their ignorance. Remember that scripture. The thing is, <clears throat> when you think you've got something squared away, be very careful. When you think you've got the answer, get on your knees as quick as you can. When you think you have figured this thing out, you are in the most dangerous place that a Christian can be. Because, like Jane said a minute ago, that it's talking about that teachable spirit. That teachable spirit begins to get seared over and we and and pride starts streaking in and we're no longer being transformed that is the place where you think you've attained it's a dangerous spot ladies don't fall victim if if at any moment just between you and yourself and you say okay i'm doing pretty good I beseech you in the Lord at that moment, if that thought ever hits your head, drop to your knees then. Because that is a dangerous place for us to be. It's a per an alcoholic reaches mm -hmm. a place and they think they can go back into a bar and minister. A person, okay, I'm over this sickness I can go back outside and do my yard work, clean up my garden. When we think we've got it licked, we are in for disaster. You're not going to have it licked until the day you get up there. Now, you've been redeemed from the curse. You are no longer a slave to sin. It's now an active choice you make every day. But don't get cocky. Amen. Okay, now I have no idea what time it is. Am my way over? I have I can't see my clock. Now we're going to go to Jeremiah. Now stick with me on Jeremiah. Jeremiah is one of my favorite prophets. Jeremiah 15, 15 through 21. <coughs> Won't they do that though, Kelly? Mm-mm-mm. O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. Thy words were found and I did eat them and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone because of thy hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. And that goes back to the, when we were talking earlier about our, our social circle getting really small. I sat alone because of thy hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. Why is my pain perpetual? Thanks, Wanda. And my wound incurable, which refuseth to be healed. Wilt thou be altogether unto me as a liar and as waters that fail? And now God answers him back. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, if thou return, then will I bring thee again. And thou shalt stand before thee, before me, and if thou take forth the precious from the vile, 
Thou shalt be as my mouth. Let them return unto thee, but return not thou unto them. And I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall, and they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee, saith the Lord, and I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. That gets me so excited. But you got to look at that first part. What is he saying? He's, they're coming against me. I'm trying to do what you told me to do. But I am absolutely alone here. And it doesn't look like you're doing anything, God. I'm sitting here <clears throat> alone. I didn't sit, sit with the mockers. I didn't rejoice with them. I, I've, done, I've done what I'm supposed to do. But I'm hurting. I'm not getting healed. And it looks like now everything you told me is a lie. But I'm trying to do my best. I'm paraphrasing. This is Angie's paraphrase. But I just read you what it says. But God said, don't you go running back to them. If you have made a stand, don't you go running back. You let them come to you. This is, we've had prodigals. We've got a prodigal right now. And Paul and I, for years and years and years, struggled how to how to be godly, how to be godly, how to do it right, how to do it right. And y'all cannot imagine the brothers and sisters in the Lord who bashed us right and left. I'm still getting rejected from people who have no clue what's going on. And then this beautiful bit from Jeremiah comes up, and he says. Don't you go running after them when you've made a stand. Take the precious from the vial. I will make unto this people a fenced brazen wall. I mean brazen being brass. A strong wall. And they'll fight against you. But they won't win. And he says, I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. What more do we need? Obviously, we're not alone. Obviously, the people of God have suffered for millennia, standing for what is right and what is of God. And have been bashed and, and attacked and insulted and shunned and everything else because of it. So you're in good company, ladies, if you stand for what is right. Nobody wants to be set alone. Nobody wants to be just ostracized from everything. But you know what? Ugh. If that is what it takes to walk and be honorable to the king of glory, then let's be willing to stand alone. Let's be willing to every night sit at our dinner table by ourselves because nobody will invite us to the party because we won't participate in their carnality. I'm not talking about not reaching out to the lost and loving those who want part of the kingdom. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about standing as the post that doesn't move in a world that wants no borders. That was my little, y'all heard that. There are borders. There are things that must be done for you to be part of the kingdom of God. He made the way, but you got to walk into it right. You can't come in through the back window. And we, as his children, as his beacons of light, if we conform ourselves so they don't feel bad, we've given them nothing. We've given them salt with no saltiness. We've, we've given nothing. We're useless. 
Colossians 2, 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through vain through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Y'all still with me? Did y'all know that fresh jello will not set? With pineapple in it. I mean, Jello will not set with fresh pineapple in it. Y'all know that. That's what the Lord showed me when I, I was reading this. I was going through these scriptures, and that's the image God gave me. Jello with fresh pineapple in it. It's liquid. There is an enzyme mm -hmm. in fresh pineapple that hinders the solidifying of the Jello. So I was sitting there pondering. I said, Lord, I appreciate that you go simple for the simple-minded. But how in the world has that got anything to do with what these scriptures are telling me? And then he said, look it up. So I did. And guess what? Jello will set with pineapple in it. But it has to be adulterated pineapple. It has to be canned pineapple that has no freshness to it. The enzyme must be removed in order for the jello to set. Think about that for just a minute. It's a silly little unimportant fact. But as a Christian, Aren't we sort of that way? We want a little bit of this in our life and we're willing to conform ourselves to the world just a little bit because that's what we want. I want pineapple in my jello. I know that canned pineapple is not good for you because it's been treated with all this stuff, all these chemicals. But I want pineapple in my jello. So I'm going to put this canned nasty stuff in my jello because I want that flavor. Yep, I know. It's silly. <laughs> it's a silly image, but that's what God does for me. He uses those things <laughs> so I can understand deep spiritual points. We cannot force God to allow our conformity to be okay. It's not going to be okay. It's just not going to be okay. We have to do it his way. Somebody's calling me. Hang on. It's my baby. Hey, honey, I'm in my Bible study. Can I call you back? Sorry, call me back. I know, I've gone over now because he always calls me about 2.15. Um, <clears throat> I had one more scripture to share with y'all. Hang on, drop my paper. Um, and this was really the biggest part of this, but I'll just wait and do this part next week. And please join me next week because the, the next part of this Bible study was so good. I was telling Paul about it last night. He said, he said, God gives you the neatest stuff. And I said, it really was a revelation to me when I was reading it. He, so I'll give you all that little cliffhanger so you'll join next week. But I hope you all have gotten something out of this. And I prayed before I started because with all this stuff, cold and my head being muddled I said God you're going to have to do this Bible study because Angie's brain ain't working but I love you guys I missed y'all so much and I don't know if y'all saw earlier but Lisa um, my sister-in-law um, asked for prayer she has an unspoken prayer request and 
and she asked for prayer and I, I said we would surely pray for her and um I pray for y'all. I'm lifting each one of you all up to the Lord. I write your names down when the Bible study's over and and I check it and y'all are so precious to me and in my life and and I'm just asking y'all this. Take the meat and spit out the bones. As you go back and study these scriptures, don't take my word for anything. I am fallible. But God's word never returns void. So you take his word and you go through it with a fine tooth comb. And you get the, the meat out and what God wants to show you, okay? I love y'all. I will see you next week.